A very good evening and welcome to yet another edition of Times exclusive airing on Times Network. My name is Brian Banda. Thank you for joining us. The program tonight is coming to you courtesy of Rainbow Paints. In this edition of the program, I'm highly honored to have uh, Professor P.L.O. Lumumba, one of uh, Africa's greatest sons. He's an expert in governance and so many uh, things. Professor Lumumba, how are you? I'm very Thank honored you. to have you uh, on Times Television tonight. Thank you very much for the invitation. You are one of the Africa's well-known orators, if I may say so. <laughs> um, you speak in conferences and different gatherings. How are you managing to do all these things? You seem to be a man on the, uh, the plane all the time. <laughs> I'm on the move. Yeah. I think... Uh, uh, by the grace of God, uh, my African brethren are finding value in some of the things that I've been saying. And I feel humbled because I get invitations from across the continent. Mm. And what I do is that I avail myself and share my thoughts. I do not hold the view that I'm an expert in the things that I say but I give my perspective in the hope that my own ideas will be cross-fertilized and cross-pollinated by others. Mm. And then we develop a conversation, uh, the object of which I believe can be to move the agenda of the issues that I articulate forward in a manner that will be beneficial to the continent of Africa. Sometimes you're welcomed and sometimes you're not. <laughs> uh, what comes to my mind is the, 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 Zimbabwe, uh, the Zambia incident yes. where you were denied entry yes. into the country. I think I'm welcomed 99% of uh, the times. Uh, the incident in Zambia is one which I do not understand. The reason given to me upon arrival at the airport is that I was a threat to national security. And I asked, whose security do I threaten? I do not bear harm. I do not bear arms. I think none harm. I do none harm. I simply speak the truth as I see it. Mm. And I did, of course, raise uh, concerns with the Zambian High Commission in Nairobi and with the Zambian uh, Foreign Affairs uh, Ministry, but up till now I've not received any response. But it's important to say mm. uh, that this year I traveled to Zimbabwe via Livingstone in Zambia and I was not denied entry, mm. which suggests to me that the Zambian government may have revised its position concerning uh, the fear of the threat that I was deemed to oppose. Or maybe you said something against the authorities there in Zambia? I have been asking myself, what is it that I could have said? Mm. Because on the evening that I arrived in Zambia, I was slated to speak about the role of China in Africa. Mm -hmm. And perhaps I speculate mm. that somebody thought that I would speak against the Chinese because during that period there had been some riots against Chinese in some parts of Zambia. But that is mere speculation. Yeah. Otherwise, I do not know and, and, and I hold the view that uh, it was a very unwise decision because I had been invited by a university, Eden University, to preside over graduation which in my view is a very honest engagement, a very innocuous engagement. Mm. It does not threaten any government. And if any government feels threatened by a mere uh, address at a graduation, then that government must be very weak. And I don't think that the Zambian government is a weak government. Talking about uh, governance, we seem to, uh, as, a, as a continent, we seem not to get things right. We have uh, leaders that want to be treated as kings in this continent. Uh, the big man syndrome, that's what we keep on seeing in Africa. Why is this so, Professor Momo? 
You know, Africa must be understood within the context of our history. And sometimes, even when we talk about Africa, we actually cloud issues. We are talking about a continent that has 54 recognized countries and one that is struggling to be recognized as such in Ambazonia. And we must remind ourselves that these countries were governed by colonizers who are Portuguese, who are French, who are British, who are Belgians, who are uh, Arabs in certain cases, and that each country is struggling with its own unique circumstances. Mm -hmm. And therefore, one, before answering that question, must look at each country on the basis of her peculiarities. I know that many African countries have had problems, but the truth be told, in the last few years, we have also seen certain positive things. Let's, let's begin with the positive things. Yeah. Look at countries such as Tanzania, which have known relative peace since they attained independence. Of course, there is no unanimity as to whether the administration is good, but the truth be told is that they have had multi-party elections and that the governments have been changing and leaders have been changing. That is a good thing. My own country, Kenya, mm -hmm. we have had our own problems. But the truth be told, there are certain areas in which we have done well. Uganda, since 1986, there are those who may argue that President Museveni has stayed in power for too long and ought to leave. But the truth be told that post Amin, Dada, who was a dictator, we see that certain things have happened well. Rwanda was genocide. We have seen that things have been moving in direction. There are people who oppose President Kagame. If you go down south in places such as uh, Namibia, uh, Botswana, Mozambique, and even South Africa, even here in Malawi, mm -hmm. there is a sense in which you have known some relative peace. But it is also true to say that even in countries where we had problems like and continue to have problems of some kind or the other, like the Democratic Republic of Congo, we have seen in the last one year that for the first time we have had a peaceful transfer of power. That does not mean that the problems have been solved because we know countries that have experienced problems post-election uh, chaos. We have seen that in countries such as Gabon. We have seen that in Central African Republic. We have seen problems in countries such as uh, Burkina Faso, can, uh, Chad, uh, Togo, and uh, Sierra Leone. But in a nutshell, one can see that there is a sense in which countries are beginning to move in some useful direction, and the citizenry are also becoming aware. And where the leaders have conducted themselves in a manner that threatens the interest of the people, the people have not hesitated to rise up. Yeah. The Arab Spring that we saw, which started in Tunisia, mm -hmm. was a good case of a people dissatisfied with, government, uh, with governance and rising up. And we saw that the, the, the departure of a leader in uh, Tunisia, we saw recently the departure of a leader in Algeria, the departure of a leader in uh, Egypt, the departure of a leader in Sudan. We have seen that happening, and I think that those are things that ought to be celebrated without, of course, losing sight of the fact that we could do better. And, and you know, yes. leaders, they don't want the voice of dissent. Yes. They don't like mm -hmm. protests. Mm -hmm. what, what's your view on these things? You know, the thing that... Uh, we call democracy mm -hmm. presupposes in my view a number of things one that the people know what they want number two that governance and governments are run in a manner that is transparent and in the best interest of the people and democracy further presupposes that information will be disseminated and the people will have the freedom to express themselves with responsibility. Mm -hmm. It is therefore incumbent upon those who are in government to be reminded time and time again that the days when people would be directed and dealt with like sheep and goats are long gone. The people will raise their voice and the people will make demands of the leaders. 
and when they make demands of the leaders in a manner that is in conformity with the prescriptions of the constitution, if there is an independent judiciary, the judiciary will protect that. And I think many leaders, whether reluctantly or otherwise in Africa, are beginning to recognize that that is a reality that you cannot run away from. And many leaders are getting surprised when people are becoming emboldened. So while it is true to say that many people in positions of political power hate to be contradicted by the population, they are also beginning to accept, whether reluctantly or not, that that is a reality that you cannot run away from and that, that those are the dividends of democracy. But let us remind ourselves, I do not believe that there is a one-size-fits-all democracy. Mm -hmm. I believe that there are certain fundamental pillars of what constitutes democracy, which is that the people must have the right and opportunity to elect the people who will serve them, and that people must be given this opportunity periodically, that governments must be run in a transparent manner, but each country may have her own peculiarities and that what we call democracy must not be prescribed from outside. What works in the United Kingdom may not work in Ghana, and what works in Brussels may not work in Namibia. You know that uh, elections in Africa most of the times they end up in court. You represented President Kenyatta in your, in your country. I actually represented the chairman of the Independent Electoral Commission. Yeah, but yeah, you, yeah. with the interest of yes, President Kenyatta. Yes, yes. What, 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 what would be your advice so that we have free and fair elections that do not end up in courts? A number of things. One of the things that amazes me is that many people who participate in elections in Africa, particularly at the level of the presidency, go into the elections with the view that they must win. Mm -hmm. And if I don't win, I've been rigged. That is problem number one. Those who are incumbent and are in positions of authority as presidents also hold the view that as long as I'm the president, I cannot lose an election. What we then need as countries is to ensure that the body that is charged with presiding over the election must do so in a manner that is independent, transparent, and believable. So that the people looking at the electoral process, because it is a process, and the electoral results can only arrive at one conclusion that the process was free, transparent, and open, and that the results that have been announced are results but which what, are credible. But what, are, what, what, what happens when the elections body seem not to be believable? That is the problem. If the election body behaves as if it is a handmaiden of the political powers that be, then you are causing a danger to the nation. That, it is very critical. When one finds oneself in the position of presiding over an electoral process, that individual presiding over that institution must make sure that the institution is beyond reproach. If you do anything or say anything mm -hmm. that begins to suggest that you are beholden to those who are in power, then the message you are sending is that the results that you will announce are not credible and increasingly Many people in Africa, the electorate in Africa, will come out and rise and say, we don't believe in the results. And when they say that, then they destabilize the nation to the detriment of everybody else. Mm -hmm. So electoral bodies mm. must be told time and time again that the position you hold of midwifing the electoral process is one that is so important that if you are a midwife, if you allow me the analogy of a midwife, mm -hmm. a midwife is neither the mother nor the child, mm -hmm. but the midwife must ensure that at the end of the process, the mother is alive and well, and that the baby is alive and well, and that all can celebrate that the process was undertaken in an open and transparent manner. And we have seen across the continent that when electoral bodies have behaved in a manner that suggests that they were not independent, the people have risen and the consequences 
have been dire. It has led to loss of lives and loss of property and, of course, the poisoning of the political environment in a manner that destabilizes the socio-economic environment. I don't know if you are aware, but we, the, the, the results of the May uh, 19 elections here, they are being challenged in court. As we speak right now, the court is probably in, in session. What advice would you give to both sides of this case? Let, let me say this. Yes. I know that Malawi as a country has a legal regime and a constitutional dispensation and that they allow, which allows those who are dissatisfied with the results of the elections to challenge those results. My view is that the reason why we have a judiciary which we want to believe is independent is that they are capable of looking at the evidence that is presented before them and once they have made a decision which is credible then it behooves all parties whether they like it or not to accept the results of the decision mm -hmm. but one of the things that i would suggest as a law reform issue and i think that kenya has done better in many than many countries in africa in this regard that Kenya requires that when there is a dispute of the presidential results, the issues are resolved before the president is sworn in. In other words, it is time bound. Mm -hmm. So that he who has been declared as the winner in a presidential election does not take the oath of office mm -hmm. until a determination has been made. And I think that is a good thing. Because when you have a system where uh, candidate has been declared the winner and they are sworn in then the process of determining the validity or otherwise of the vote is then determined then it does create problems and 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 it does create some kind of uh, dissatisfaction hmm. and we have seen that in countries such as nigeria we saw that uh, in gabon and uh, we are seeing that in malawi Hmm. So going forward, I think the people of Malawi, and they are wise enough, they need not to be guided by foreigners such as myself, they are wise enough to borrow from best practices elsewhere, to look at the law and determine how best to ensure that the results are determined within a time period which does not take too long from the day of declaration of the results. You have been in court probably with a similar case. Yes, indeed. What has been your experience? My experience, of course, is that uh, it is important, number one, to have a judicial process which is open and which is transparent. It is also important that the electoral body has a process which is properly documented. It is also important that the judges who are seized of the matter are capable of appreciating the issues and dealing with the issues without undue delay. It is also important that the players themselves accept that they submit to the jurisdiction of the court. Mm -hmm. And it is critical that once they have submitted to the jurisdiction of the court, they must accept the outcome, whether they like it or not because it is in the nature of court processes that a decision must be made one way or the other. Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen recently, I think it is only last week in Nigeria, where a decision has been made by the court in Nigeria declaring that the election of President Buhari was valid and therefore legitimate. And I like what uh, the candidate Atikwa Bubakara said. Mm -hmm. said, I'm dissatisfied with this result, but I'm going to the next level. And once you have exhausted the judicial process, then you accept that this is what a democratic dispensation gives us. And whether I like it or not, for the general good of the country, I'm going to live with a result that I don't like. Let's talk about uh, development. Yes. You know that people don't eat politics, mm -hmm. as they say. Mm -hmm. People want development. They want good water. They want good food. They want to, you, you, to live in good houses. Malawi, uh, I don't know how familiar you are with Malawi. Malawi is blessed. We, you know, two-thirds of our country is water. But we are a country that is probably almost every year we don't have enough to feed our own people. We are faced by so many challenges as a country. Where are we getting it wrong? Let, let me uh, take a totally different perspective. Uh, this is the only is something that I only hear in Africa. Mm -hmm. 
that politics is different from development. <laughs> My understanding of politics mm -hmm. is that politics is the entire process of organizing the, natu the national resources of a country, whether they are natural resources or human resources, for purposes of ensuring that the quality of a people's lives are improved. Politics is at the center of development. Politics is what creates the oxygen which allow development. That is why when it's not people, outside. When it's it, is, it cannot be. be because people it, it here cannot be. because people here they say we don't eat politics. No, but you see people confuse political statements that are made at funerals and weddings for politics. Politics is a much more is a much broader thing. Polit when politics stumble, mm -hmm. then the country collapses. Yeah. Politics is what development is all about. So let us not talk as if Politics is one thing and development is another. The process of organizing the affairs of a nation to achieve economic and social development is what politics is all about. But to answer your question a lot more directly, mm -hmm. Malawi is not in a different position from many African countries. If a country identifies what our priorities are, mm. then that country will marshal her resources, including the human resources, because the most important resource in any country are the human resources. You go to countries such as Singapore, what do they have? You go to, go to places such as Dubai, what do they have? They don't, what they have succeeded in doing is marshalling their resources, the little resources that they have, and organize themselves in a manner that addresses the quality of a people's life. Because people want, to f want food. Mm -hmm. And you tell me, you remember when President Mbingu wa Mutarika mm -hmm. became the president of this country. Mm -hmm. There was a time when from, uh, Malawi had famine, and he came and mm -hmm. reorganized agriculture. Yeah. And for some time, you had food surplus. Yeah. Kenya did buy maize from Malawi. Mm -hmm. It tells you that it can be done. It can be done, yes. It tells you that Malawi was at one time one of the greatest exporters of tobacco. It still remains mm -hmm. a major backbone, backbone of the Malawian economy. What one must do is to identify the priorities of the nation. And I believe Malawi in what is now called the blue economy. What are you doing on Lake Tanganyika? What are you doing with your fishing resources? Uh, the Lake Malawi remains one of the cleanest lakes on the continent of Africa. Mm -hmm. The fish that you produce here, Chambo, is one that you can grow and propagate in commercial quantities. What about gas? What is happening in Lake Tanganyika? What about agriculture? If we had good agriculture in Zimbabwe, who tells you that we cannot have that kind of agriculture here? There are many things that can be done, but the political class in Malawi, as in many African countries, must be called to order. Mm -hmm. They must be told that the people want good food in order to improve their nutrition. They must be told that the people want good education. They must be told that young people want an opportunity not just to be employed, but they want an opportunity to innovate and to invent, and that Malawi has the capacity to achieve that, and that can be done. And I hold the view that uh, President Professor Mutarika, with the, ex the, the exposure that he has had uh, in different parts of the world, particularly in the United States of America, and with education, should marshal his cabinet in such a manner that Malawi addresses those issues and uses her position as being in the center of SADC mm. as a country that can be the engine in many ways. It can be done. It can and be it done. must be done. So what kind of people can they propel such kind of uh, success? You know, because you talk about Rwanda. Yes. They have done extremely well. Yes. Here we have almost everything that we need, but we have challenges. What kind of people can lead us from that kind of challenge? You know, every country has challenges, but I hold the view that one must have clarity of vision. One of the reasons why, and, and I say this almost ad nauseum, is that post-genocide, the Kagame regime in mm. Rwanda identified critical things for the benefit of our people. Say, number one, we are landlocked. Yeah. Number two, we don't even have a lot of natural resources, but we are capable of using the little resources in an efficient manner. Mm -hmm. We are capable of making our country attractive. 
we are capable of ensuring that we marshal all these resources and we are capable of allowing men and women who love Rwanda to serve Rwanda. Malawi can do that because I think Malawi does have more natural resources than Rwanda can begin to imagine. Mm -hmm. Once you do that, and it has been demonstrated that it can be done, and you can do it if you have men and women who are dedicated and who have clarity of vision, men and women who have identified the priorities, men and women who know what your weaknesses and strengths are, and a population that makes demands. Mm. History has demonstrated not once, not twice, that the level of development is also determined by the demands that people make on their leadership. If you worship leaders as if they were demigods, then leaders will not serve you as they ought to. Yeah. It can be done, it must be done, and Malawi has the capacity to do it. You know that uh, one of the evils that we have in Africa is tribalism, yes. nepotism, if you may want to call it that way. Uh, it has not spared Malawi. How can we handle this problem? Because even in voting, when people are voting, they vote on tribal lines. How can we get rid of this mentality to move on as a country? <laughs> let, let, let me say this. Yeah. First of all, if you see any political or politician who uses Ethnic, eth ethnic affiliation and religion as a basis for marshalling the populace. That is a leader who is ideologically bankrupt. And many leaders are quick to appeal to what I call the primordial instincts of people from their tribes. Those are people who will not lead anybody anywhere. The population must also be educated to know mm -hmm. that the fact that somebody comes from your village or from your tribe does not make him or her a good leader. You must ask yourself, ultimately, what do you want? What you want are good roads. What you want are uh, facilities in the hospitals. What you want are uh, opportunities for people. What you want are things that will improve the quality of your lives. And those are ethnically neutral. African electorate must be educated to know that that is the only way forward. Has it been done? Yes, Tanzania. Hmm. Tanzania, which has over 136 tribes, does not vote on the basis of ethnicity. If you ask any average Tanzania, and you ask them, what was the tribe of Malibu Nyerere? Half of them will not know. You ask them, what was the tribe of Ali Hassan when you are president? They do not know. What was the president of uh, the tribe of President Mkapa and Kikwete and John Pombe Magufuli? They do not know. Because the founding father liberated himself from the muck and mire of thinking that ethnicity is an important factor in national development. It must be done. Unfortunately, in a number of African countries, people who have gone to school, formal education, mm. who appeal to the ethnic sensibilities of the electorate, telling them that because I am from your tribe, therefore when I become the president, your circumstances will change. People should just ask the, yourself, themselves, is it true that when somebody from your tribe and village is a president or a minister, your circumstances change? The, circumstances, the answer is no elect men and women who are capable of delivering regardless of their tribe. Professor Lumumba, we have to take a short thank break. Thank you, thank you very we'll be much. We'll back with you thank in you. a moment. In case thank you. you are just joining us, you're watching Times Exclusive on Times Network. Tonight I'm joined by Professor P.L.O. Lumumba, one of, the, one of uh, Africa's orators and an expert on governance and other matters including corruption. When we come back, we'll talk about corruption. Yes. Don't go away. We'll be back momentarily. Weather Shield, another brand from Rainbow Paints.
This is Outlet. An extreme high performance acrylic smooth textured finishing with ultraviolet absorption and maximum flexibility properties for wall finishes. A built in fungicide to resist molds. Simple to use, quick drying, water resistant binding power, low dirt retention, and hides hairline cracks. Suitable for use on all exterior walls, be it plaster, concrete, or brickwork. Available in a wide range of colors in 5 and 20 liter containers. Contact us today in Blantyre 01 841 813 01 841 871 Lilongwe 01 755 901. Email info at rainbowpaints.biz. Rainbow Paints. Peace of mind, part of the deal. Times Television. And you're watching Times Exclusive. I'm Brian Banda. I'm joined by uh, one of uh, Africa's renowned uh, experts in issues uh, that concern us as a continent, corruption, development, and other matters, uh, Professor PLO uh, Lumumba. You actually, <laughs> you, you, you actually want to be uh, addressed as such, yeah. PLO Lumumba. I think I'm known as such, so mm. it is better to refer to me in terms that are familiar. Professor, one of the evils confronting Africa is corruption. You were once the director of uh, Kenya's version of the SCB here, mm -hmm. the Anti-Corruption Bureau here. Where are we getting it wrong in the fight against corruption? Not only in Malawi, but in Africa. Let us begin from the premise that the international community has acknowledged that corruption is a problem of a universal nature. That is why we have the United Nations against corruption. Africa has admitted that it is a continental problem. That is why we have the African Convention for preventing and combating corruption. Many African countries have now created specialized bodies to spearhead the fight against corruption. And you, I'm using the word spearhead mm. deliberately because there is this misguided assumption that bodies such as those will eliminate corruption. Mm. All of us must be involved in the fight against corruption. And that is why it is acknowledged that there are three ways of dealing with the scourge of corruption. Education, so that the people are sensitized about the ills of corruption so that people don't believe that corruption is a victimless crime. So that people are able to appreciate that when they have bad roads, when they have bad schools, when they don't have medicine in the hospitals, when they don't have things that ought to improve the quality of their lives, it's because money has been spent in the manner that it ought not to be prevent, to, to have been spent. And that further, that we prevent corruption and when people participate in corruption, if they are found guilty in accordance with the law, then they are punished in a manner that is in conformity with the law. The problem that we have in many African countries and that we have had in many African countries is that corruption became a way of life. Hmm. In different parts of the world, there is corruption, but it is the exception other than the rule. The beauty in many countries now is that the population is beginning to realize that corruption must be fought and that their lives are affected by corruption. Why do I say so? If you look at the revolution that are taking place or the changes that are taking place in many African countries now, look at what happened in Algeria, the removal of President Bouteflika. The people said, you preside over a corrupt regime. We are removing you, and they removed him. If you look at what is sometimes described as the Arab Spring in Tunisia, and even the election that was held a few weeks ago, it is held on the basis following a death, but the people are saying, we want corruption eliminated. Mm. When President uh, Mubarak was removed in Egypt, the people are saying it is because of corruption. When Bashir was removed in Sudan, people are saying it is because of corruption. Here in your own country, there was a time when we had a cash gate, and the people are annoyed about it mm. and they were saying we must fight against it mm. and i think that that is a good thing the realization that you as a people are sick mm. and that you need medicine that is the beginning of resolving the problem but as i said a little earlier in the fight against social ills the people must remain eternally vigilant. It's yeah. eternal vigilance that ensures that people are asked and questioned about their wealth. 
it is incomprehensible and unacceptable mm. that somebody whom we know has a salary of one million kwacha is involved in projects that involve billions of kwacha and yet we celebrate them. We must ensure that people live within their means. And there are African leaders who have lived within their means and we remember them fondly. Now, yeah. in that regard, yes. what can people do? Yes. Because what, I don't know what happens in, in government or in politics. Someone is earning 100,000 kwacha. Now, he goes into government. He's an overnight millionaire or billionaire. The, what can people do in that regard? But people have been doing things in Africa. Let, I, I was making a, 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 an argument that mm -hmm. there are African leaders who have actually demonstrated that you can live within your means. Kenneth David Kaunda of Zambia, when he left office, it is on record that he, has no, he had no more than the equivalent of $8,000 in his account. Julius Nyerere of Tanzania. In other words, you can serve a people, you can hold a public office and live within your means and you will be celebrated. Mm -hmm. But what must be done, and this is what must be done consistently by Africans, is that when people misbehave, then they must be punished. Have we seen such punishment? Yes, there are people who are being taken to court, there are people whose properties are being seized, and once that is happening, and once people know that when you acquire property in an improper manner, that property will be seized and be taken away from you, then they'll know that you cannot continue to eat the fruits of a poison tree. The and that if a, you do the so, the fruits of a poison you tree, you will die. The fruits of a poison yes. tree. Yes. What about uh, if you had a chance to design the best anti-corruption body? How would you design it? I would not go that route. These are assumptions. Mm. that corruption is a Goliath and that you need a God-inspired David with a sling and a stone to fell Goliath is misguided. All of us have a duty to fight corruption. Wherever you are, if you are a Malawi and you are in Lilongwe and you are a school teacher, don't take a pen which does not belong to you and take you to your child at home. If you are a farmer who is invested with assets of your cooperative society, make sure that you are a good protector of those things all of us have a duty to participate in the fight against corruption and all of us have a duty to ensure that we create an environment which is hostile for the survival of those who participate in corruption and when we are called upon to vote don't ask those who are seeking votes for money because when you are bribed as a voter mm -hmm. you cannot begin to question corruption because these fellows who you ask to bribe you when you are voting, where do they get the money from? We cannot condemn corruption if we ourselves have partaken of the corrupt proceeds. All of us have a duty. But to the extent that we know that corruption will subsist, it is important, in my view, to create an anti-corruption body which has the power to prosecute, which is well-resourced, so that it is capable of discharging its mandate of educating the people, it is capable of discharging its mandate of working with governmental bodies and private bodies to ensure that you create an environment that reduces incidents of corruption, and it is also capable of prosecuting the cases that it has investigated. You have been a, yes. the chief of Correct. corruption board yes. in Kenya. Correct. How did you do it? First of all, it is important to note that I served for only one year, and at the time that we were serving, we were a staff of only 145. You cannot expect 145 people to deal with multiple government organizations. But what we did, and what continues to be done by the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission, is that they educate the people, that they work with institutions for purposes of ensuring that incidents of corruption are dealt with. They don't have the power to prosecute, but they work with the director of public prosecution, and when there is credible evidence, men and women are brought before courts of law, and the judiciary tries them, and if there is evidence, then they are convicted. But as I said, each country must address its own circumstances in a unique way. Mm -hmm. Here you have uh, your anti-corruption bureau. 
in Tanzania they have their own, in South Africa they have had their own hawks, in uh, Zimbabwe they have their own. The critical thing is that each country must address the circumstances of corruption in a manner that is informed by those unique circumstances with a view to achieving a society where corruption is the exception other than the rule. Do you think, yes. in your opinion, it is proper and right for presidents to hire and defy chiefs of the anti-corruption bodies? You know, these are questions, somebody must be hired by somebody. You mm. can't hire yourself. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. there, is, there is a process of mm. hiring people. And once you are hired, and uh, in Kenya, for example, when you are occupying such a position, you would invariably apply to a body, and once you have applied, you'll be subjected to an interview process, and once you've been subjected to an interview process, you'll then be subjected to parliamentary scrutiny, and once you've been subjected to parliamentary, parliamentary scrutiny, then the president will formally appoint you. The mere fact that a person has been appointed by a person or a body does not mean they cannot be functionally independent. As long as the law is clear about functional independence, then a person can be independent. Because in any event, mm -hmm. even an anti-corruption body is a part of a governmental system. Yeah. It cannot work outside of it. It is operating on the basis of funds that are voted by parliament it must be answerable at least at the policy level to a particular body so let us not obsess ourselves as if we can have god appointing people and imposing them on others they'll be appointed by human beings mm -hmm. but they have a duty to exercise because their the, functions without fear or favor but the challenge is that you yeah. cannot uh, you, can, you, you cannot do anything to the hand that has appointed you. That is not true. In South Africa, Tuli Madon Sela, who was recommending the prosecution of President Zuma, was appointed by a body which had Zuma participating in the process. We have seen Nuhuribadu in, uh, in, in Nigeria was appointed by the president. That is not true. The problem that we also have in Africa is that we are quick to use negative examples mm -hmm. and we forget to cite certain things that have worked. There are many places in Africa where people have been prosecuted and people have recommended prosecution even of presidents. Yeah, because here yes. the assertion has been that it is difficult to, you know, to investigate those that are in power because the chief, the anti-corruption uh, bureau chief, is appointed by the president. The, the, then the, the, that individual who is afraid to investigate the president and others is just a coward. And, and then there is no cure for cowardice. If, if a person has been appointed and he has powers that are vested in him by law, then as long as you operate within the law, then you are doing the right thing. So let us not blame the law for the weakness of individuals who are cowards. And let us not assume that simply because a particular individual is incapable of discharging their mandate, then the system is wrong. Mm. Otherwise, we'll, we'll be amending the law every other time. Mm. We'll be amending the law every other time. But it must be remembered yeah. that the fight against corruption is a very lonely fight. Even those who shout at the top of their voice that we want the fight against corruption to be enhanced, if you begin to touch them, they begin to have behave differently. Mm. And it is a very dangerous place to be in. It is a very dangerous place you to be in. You have been there, so yes. you know what you're talking about. So people should not just say, as they say, in, mm. the, in the safety of their homes, it is an easy thing. It is dangerous. Your lives are threatened. Your family may be threatened. So it is very easy to sit in the comfort of your home and say, oh, let's fight, let us do this, we want blood. And you also want, pe people cannot just be arrested. Mm. There must be evidence according to law. Yeah. And it must be remembered that truth according, justice according to law and truth are two separate things sometimes. You cannot just take people to court because it is something that is popular. There must be evidence. It could very well be true that somebody has stolen but there must be yeah. credible yeah. evidence yeah. which will move a court of law. And it's only then that you uh, uh, recommend people to be prosecuted. But I hear many people want this, what I call populist uh, demand for blood, like they demanded the blood of Jesus, crucify him, crucify him. We don't, I don't believe that. So we that cannot is, fight corruption in that no, sense? No, if you do that, it is only good if 
another person is being crucified. But I ask people to ask yourself, mm. what about if you yourself mm. are falsely accused? And I know many people mm. who have been falsely accused and are innocent. We must give them the opportunity to demonstrate that they are not guilty. Professor Mumba, you are well known for preaching good political governance, yeah. transparency and accountability. People might be asking, why have you failed to sell yourself to the electorate? Uh, two things. First, first, first of all, is not true. In yeah. the year 2007, I participated in the electoral process as a candidate. So on I, a parliamentary level? Yes, I did. Yeah, but I'm talking on, on a higher level. No, but, uh, you, you're probably capable of <laughs> being a president. You advise presidents and governments. I mean, while that is possible, mm -hmm. who knows? In future, one day, I may want to say Are that. Are you contemplating? Not for the moment. But I'm saying that this obsession, there is also a problem in Africa. Mm. The problem that everybody must want to be a president. The problem that everybody must want to be a minister. Everybody must want to be in government. You can serve your country in different capacities. If you are an accountant, you can serve your country in that capacity. If you are a lawyer, you can serve your country in that capacity. If you are a doctor, you can serve your country in that capacity. Some of the greatest men on earth have never held any public office. Which public office did Martin Luther King Jr. hold? Mm. Which public office did Malcolm X hold? Which public office did Mahatma Gandhi hold? Which public office before he died did Steve Biko hold? Which public office did Desmond Mpilo to, to hold? So this idea that all of us must be in government is misguided. I believe that if one chooses an area in which they serve, then that is their contribution. Right now, by grace of God mm. and by courtesy of my fellow Africans, I travel across many African countries. And I want to believe that by merely standing, if you may, like John the Baptist in the wilderness and making certain pronouncements, I'm out of ten hearts, I'm possibly touching one. And that is my current contribution. As to what I will contribute in future, not even the Be devil because knows others the might say you are, you are a good orator yes but you haven't been in power so being outside can mean something else and they're entitled to say that they're entitled to say that and i won't argue with them but they would be wrong i've been in government position i was the secretary of the kenya review commission constitution review commission for, for, yeah. Yeah, for five years mm. i was at head of anti-corruption i've held many positions and i continue to make a contribution but there is no shortage of professional fault finders Okay. Those ones I don't worry about. Okay. Winston Churchill, who was a racist and I don't like very much, used to say that if you want to look at every person who throws a stone at you, you will never make any progress. You must do what you are doing and allow those, the critics. Mm -hmm. Critics are people who make a contribution, but they do not know the pain of suffering. Mm -hmm. So some of us who actually have the courage to say what we are saying. We are making a contribution. So you are hiding in your bedroom and uh, hiding under the pillow and hiding under the anonymity of Twitter and WhatsApp and mm. Facebook and Instagram without making your positions yeah. known yeah. Is, is sometimes not and very they're, useful. They're quite a lot. Oh, there are legions <laughs> of, 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 who hide uh, behind the anonymity of WhatsApp. Mm. But at least some of us, by God's grace, mm. are raising our voices. So you are speaking yeah. the right stuff. Yes. You are giving the right advice. Yes. Are the African leaders listening? And if they are listening, are they doing the right thing? You know, that is a question that is too broad mm. to be answered in the manner that you possibly expect. When I am invited to speak at an audience, as I have been invited here to speak to accountants. I'm speaking to accountants. And my hope is that the 2,500 accountants that I'll be speaking to here in Malawi are men and women in positions of leadership. If I say something that is worthwhile, they'll pick, they'll separate the wheat from the chaff. And if they accept that there is certain wheat, they'll go and propagate it. If somebody else in position of leadership thinks that I've said something that is worthy, then they will use their position to make it worthwhile. And I believe that it is our duty, not my duty as an individual, it is our duty collectively as Africans, as Malawians, as Namibians, 
to ensure that what I am doing and what we are doing collectively informs the national agenda in a manner that brings changes. And I want to say this. Sometimes we Africans are very negative and hard on ourselves. Mm. Why? When you listen to African commentators, particularly people in the media such as yourself, mm. you want to speak some, not you of course, but <laughs> others, want to speak as if nothing is happening in Africa. Nothing good is happening in, Af is happening in Africa. But there are good things. Well, the only thing that we are saying is that things could happen a lot better. Yeah. So let us identify the positive things that are happening and also give them the oxygen of publicity. Yeah. Let us also give them the opportunity to thrive so that people can know that Africa can work. Take, for example, good things that are happening in Africa. In Morocco, they are dealing with solar. In a, one of the biggest solar farms is going to be in Morocco. In Kenya, we have one of the biggest wind farms in the world. Mm. Those are good things. In, uh, in Rwanda, beautiful things are happening. In Namibia, beautiful things are happening. Let us talk about that. But we should not stop condemning the ill that are taking place. In other words, let us give a balanced view. Mm. We must tell our story in all its permutations. Let's move on. What, what would be your advice uh, to South Africa? South Africa yeah. is uh, uh, facing so many challenges, yes. uh, violence against people that are not citizens of South Africa. This is happening time and again. Yes. What would be your advice to African countries and indeed the government of South Africa? First of all, one must understand the history of South Africa. South Africa since it became a democratic country is only 25 years. And that is after they had been subjected to a regime that dehumanized the people through apartheid. And for that reason, you will find that in South Africa, we still have a large population, nearly 80% of the population do not participate in the economy. And the net effect is that they are traumatized and they are impatient with what their government is doing. But they must be reminded, particularly the government must be reminded, that you have a duty to tell your people that your enemies are not people from Malawi, not people from Zambia, not people from Namibia, not people from Nigeria. Your enemies are the men and women whom you have entrusted with the resources to create opportunities for yourself. Mm. Because when you begin to expel Nigerians and Ghanaians, once you have expelled all of them and your circumstances do not change, then you will turn on each other hmm. and you will destroy the country. So my own view is that I would want to see President Cyril Ramaphosa telling the people in a passionate manner that your problem is not with fellow Africans. These fellow Africans actually helped you during the struggle. They denied themselves. They were part of the frontline states. And for that reason, it is critical that you accommodate them. And I am happy that I've listened to my friend, uh, my friend uh, uh, Malema speaking out loudly. I would want to see President Cyril Ramaphosa speaking a lot more loudly. I've heard President, or rather, a former Premier uh, of KwaZulu-Natal, uh, uh, I think, uh, what is his name? Mongasutu Butelezi also coming out and speaking loudly. I would want to hear more voices. How do we deal with the problem of people trekking to South Africa for greener pass? I will finish on that note. Tonight. Let me tell you, if you are a strong economy, and I've said this, and I said this at the University of Mpumalanga only two weeks ago, as long as you are an economic giant, you must expect that people will come to you. It is the strong that people seek solace. So South Africa, as long as her economy is a strong economy, it is going to be important that they appreciate that people will look for those opportunities. And they too must remember that South African goods and services will only be valuable if they have a wider market. Yeah. They have their banks in West Africa, they have their banks in East Africa, they have their banks in Sadak, they have their own uh, supermarkets, shop right throughout the continent, and they must know that there is an umbilical cord between the country and other African countries because if they, were, they are isolated in the manner in which they were, the apartheid regime was isolated, it will not be in their best interest. And they must know 
that that is not what we can do, particularly when we talk about African unity, when we talk about SADC, when we talk about free movement of goods and services, they must know that Africa can only unite if there is free movement of goods and free movement of labor. That is the way that Africa is going to survive. We'll finish on that note yeah. uh, tonight, <laughs> Professor Lumumba. Yeah. Thank, you, thank you very much thank for you very joining much. us tonight. Thank you very much. Well, on that note, we conclude this exciting hour uh, of our discussion with Professor Lumumba. Thank you. My name is Brian Banda from all of us here in the lecture district of Mangoji. Thank you very much for joining us, and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.